Hello and welcome to this deep dive conversation. Roma and travellers make up Europe's single largest minority group, but their numbers and geographic spread across the region have done them few favours. According to some estimates, the health of Roma and travellers is so bad that many of them can expect to live a full 15 years fewer than most other people. This is surely the result of the endemic poverty suffered by marginalised communities with unfair and unequal access to services. Substandard education means academic attainment is dismal by comparison too. Stigmatised everywhere, often harried and usually disrespected, Roma and travellers are effectively dehumanised by anti-gypsyism, an enduring and quite vicious socially acceptable form of prejudice. So, what is to be done? With me to discuss the pathways out of this appalling situation is Jonathan Lee. Jonathan is the Communication Coordinator of the European Roma Rights Centre. Jonathan graduated with a Master's Degree in Middle East and Islamic Studies from the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. Jonathan, who is of traveller origin, has also been a caseworker for an English Roma and Traveller Liaison Service, and I'm delighted that he is my guest for this deep dive conversation today. Jonathan Lee, welcome. Hi Nigel, thanks for having me. So to begin with Jonathan, uh, was it a natural move for you to join others in fighting for the human rights of Roma and Traveller people? No, it was a complete accident, like uh, like the best things I guess. Um, so my father's side of the family are Welsh Romani, um, which I'd never really considered to be something that would particularly lead me to work in this field. Um, as you said, my master's was in uh, Arab and Islamic studies, so I was kind of assuming I'd end up more in a related field to that, uh, probably Working not. Working for the government? No, no, that was the only thing I'd uh, dis <laughs> disregarded, actually. Um, as you said, I'd been working uh, with Romani and Traveller Rights previously on a local level uh, in the county where my university was in, uh, but for some reason it was always kind of a secondary pursuit. Um, I think because in Wales, when I was a bit younger, there just wasn't the level of activity uh, then with local NGOs, with outreach programmes compared to now. Um, human rights activism and anti-racist campaigning wasn't really something people talked about. Um, compared to now, you've got, in Wales and the UK, a much stronger, much more growing voice um, that's like recognising and calling out institutional racism, which is mostly now being led actually by a quite a strong and vibrant uh, youth component who are more and more uh, well-educated, more savvy about community-driven human rights activism. Uh, I think that's partly generational, maybe, um, compared to when, although there's not much between me and this sort of current generation, social media has made such a huge difference in how you can um, build contacts for anti-racism groups across Europe. It's a lot more collaborative than before. Uh, yeah, so a job came up in the European Roma Rights Centre. I thought, yeah, you know, it's with the background, I might as well apply for it. And uh, two years later, I'm in Hungary, I'm working across Europe, and... Uh, yeah, but no, happy accident. So there was no consciousness that something was pretty terrible when it came to the treatment of Roma and Traveller people. There was never a sense growing up that you could be part of a solution. I mean, yeah, obviously, you know from fairly early on how things are. It's not it's fairly obvious. Um, I think, so a woman I interviewed when I was working as a caseworker before kind of sums it up. Uh, she said, I was asking, I was doing a survey, why is there a gap between um, the number of hate crimes we know are happening and the reported incidents that we get from the Romania travel community? And she said, if I had to report everything that happened to me, I'd be reporting things all day, every day. It's just, it becomes so normalized that that's not something you'd think like, oh, I don't know, uh, you go to a pub and they'll say, oh, sorry, no, no gypsies, no travelers. You know, if that happens to you, once, twice a week, and that's like the smallest thing that happens to you in that week, it kind of ends up being something that you start accepting, you start taking on as part of an identity. Um, for me, I grew up in bricks and mortar, I was in a house. Um, my mother's uh, American, so that helped a lot. It's a lot easier for me to blend in. Um, but yeah, I don't know, like, as I sort of got out of my teens, you start noticing it's not just a school thing, you see more in day-to-day -day life. Uh, you look at things on the internet as well, and you see what's happening in Eastern Europe compared to in Britain where I was, and that really opened me up to how bad things really are. Um, also, stuff with Holocaust remembrance has gotten a lot stronger in recently, 
this DK Nabista, this look and never forget program that operates across Europe. Uh, that's Ratstad really showing the level, like the, the pure scale of the Romani Holocaust, which is something we never learned about in school, obviously. Uh, so yeah, it was kind of a gradual sort of awareness, I suppose. And let me just to sort of delve a little bit deeper. I don't see black Romani a traveler, whatever it might be, in many ways is something that is forced onto you, or it can be a choice. So you can choose to identify with a group because because of your experiences as a child or something happens to you, or you can choose not to. Why did you opt in, so to speak? Mm. Given, given that there were so many influences that could have taken you in a different direction. Your mother is American. Uh, if you allow me to say... Unless you tell me, I wouldn't know that you are uh, of Romani origin. Um, oh, yeah. Also, <laughs> also, you've done, uh, you've pursued the sort of the classic path of integration by being extremely well educated. So, unless you mention it, unless you, unless you identify as a as a person of Roma origin, then you could quite happily move out of the community, move out of the. Uh, n n no longer attach yourself to the interests of that community and live your life uh, free of any uh, any problems uh, linked to anti-gypsyism. Is that a fair assessment, Jonathan? I mean, it sounds essentially it's the difference between uh, inclusion and assimilation. Uh, Power of assimilation is enormous in Western culture. Yeah, definitely. Um, so part of it is... Um, my youngest sister, my only sister, um, when she finished secondary school, um, myself, my father, a few others in our family suddenly sort of became aware that it's okay to talk about that a bit more. Now, one of the big rules in our family is that for a start, a lot of the younger kids are not told, um, exactly what we are kind of until later, which is a bizarre sort of, uh, thing to think about when you're an adult looking back that how you didn't realize uh but the reason being that in school uh the discrimination is so much worse kids are so much worse than adults in so many ways like that um as soon as she turns 16 she leaves secondary school the risk of her being we attacked in school us having to move things like that drops significantly um so all of a sudden we're kind of free to be unapologetic about it um, I can talk about this now on this podcast, um, and I don't have any fear that there's going to be backlash at home about it. Uh, with, like, choosing whether to or not, um, it's not something you really choose. Um, it's something you choose to hide or show, I'd say. Um, and whether I sort of... Uh, the the negatives say that come with identifying as a Romania traveller person in the public come a lot of those are based on as you say misconceptions that poverty is somehow a part of Romani culture um, whereas actually poverty is a symptom of racism I'd say it's not an accident that Roma happen to be the poorest and most um, discriminated group in Europe it's a consequence. Um, you know, when Roma have their rights violated, it's very rarely the fault of one or two racists who particularly don't like Roma. It's a, an institutional problem. Uh, so it's kind of almost whether you identify or not, you'll still be aware of everything. Everywhere you go, you'll hear hate speech. Um, you'll see other people who are maybe more obviously Romani. Or in Britain, as you know, like with travellers, there's virtually no physical difference that you would notice skin colour or... I don't know, facial features. Um, yet in Britain, there's this sort of, I don't know, instinctive ability amongst British people to identify race and class like nowhere else I've been. Uh, so most people, I'd say, can almost ident like instantly identify if a group of travellers walk into a place separate to a group of Irish people, say. Uh, so in, in part, no, it's not, it's not something that you, you can choose to sort of disregard or take on, like a coat or anything. So in that... With that in mind, then, Jonathan, um, give us a sense of, of the of the situation in which you grew up. 
Um, Because we have, I'm going to talk about this later in our our conversation, about some of these myths and stereotypes that we have about (coughs) Romani and travellers. Give us a sense of of how you grew up. Clearly you were not living in a a caravan wearing uh, traditional outfits and and going to school. I mean, uh, that's clearly not your experience. So just just give us, I think it'd be interesting for for me and also for the audience to to know how you grew up and, and what your contacts were with other uh, Romani and uh, Roma and, and traveler people too. Okay, so let's say my grandfather um, was born in a layby near Kafili in like an old boat top wagon. Um, he was, or his generation, were the last to sort of have the the rosy tinted like romantic version that I think most people have of British Romani. Um, they moved between Hereford, along the English borders, into Caerphilly and Cerdigion. Um, they went to pick hops in the summer, they made things and sold them. It was very much the sort of anachronistic existence that people associate with Western travelling Romani people. Um, which is important to say that that is a very much a British existence. I think a lot of the times the British Romani child in Calais uh, portrait, as well as the Spanish, kind of gets superimposed over all of Europe's Roma. Um, you have Eastern European, like Slovak, Romanian Roma, who never travelled. They lived in settlements for 500 years. But anyway, um, yeah. So his father died when he was 14, um, which made him head of the family. At that time, there's a quite a sort of tribal structure in that there's a head of various small family groups. Um, so him and his mother, who's a very strong woman, moved to Swansea, which is where our only family that they knew of were. Uh, and moved into uh, an estate called the Harvard in Swansea. Um, so he's gone from a hard life but living in the country with his dog and lots of freedom and moving around to a terraced house in industrialised Swansea, which would have been horrific. Um, so then my father was born in like a prefab house, these post-war things which were meant to last 10 years and... 50 years later, they're still all there. I don't know, in Wales anyway. Uh, so he was sort of the first who was, I guess, semi-settled. Um, they moved around a bit there. They still went in the summer a lot, um, in the caravans and that. But from there onwards, he pretty much constantly went to school until he was 16, which I think was a big uh, step in sort of maintaining a settled existence. Um, he joined the Air Force, uh, met my mother as American, uh, which has a large, I think, influence in the fact that I went to university. That was not something, I didn't know anyone who had gone to university, apart from American family. So it wasn't really something that, like, uh, I'd really ever considered. I wasn't like, you know, your family tell you do well in school. Do well in school is quite a big thing in Romani cultures across Europe, actually. School is quite an important, uh, and I think most sort of, Emigrant minority population school ends up being most of the parents know the value of schooling, uh, even if the stereotype is that Roma don't want to go to school. Um, so yeah, I think it ended up with me living. We lived in a few houses, but no more than a normal person. Um, I went to quite a few schools, but I never had a long uninterrupted break um, in my school life. Um, my sister's was a lot more sort of like integrated existence. She, um, one house, one school, uh, most of her friends are not Romani or travellers. Um, most of our contacts with, uh, we don't really have much contact with travellers at all, actually. We know a few families, um, one's married in. But um, with other gypsy groups um, in South Wales, it's mostly just extended family. Um, partly because there wasn't this uh, this sort of network that exists now. There's a movement called Travelling Ahead in Wales which started, which brings together young people from gypsy traveller, English traveller, lots of sort of nomadic traditional groups in the UK um, and brings them to like conferences, gives them trainings, you get to do like social activities and it creates sort of this wider youth identity. Whereas for me, we never had that. Um, so it's very much limited to like extended family which is pretty large, but like we were more isolated in that sense. Okay, so uh, there's a lot in there, Jonathan. So on the one hand, your father and your family is not 
impressing on you the fact that you are of Romani origin uh, as a form of self-protection. And yet you are still in contact with Romani families. You still have a sense of your own identity. Uh, at, did you have an experience as a, as a young man growing up in Wales of anti-Gypsyism as we now know it? Um, in school, I was largely protected from it um, until like secondary school because for a start, I was too young to be told. And then when I was, I don't know, eight or something, you're told, but you're told with like a, a, a caveat that's sort of like, you can't tell anyone if you tell, you know, you tell your best friend tomorrow, they're no longer, they go home, see their parents, they come back. It's not your best friend anymore, um, which is broadly true. Um, so it wasn't really until I got out into like comprehensive school um, and then like a few people found out you started to get nothing like too bad, like chanting. Um, it became a sort of thing that like in passing conversation, if anything would go wrong between you in an argument or something with people you didn't know very well, that's the first thing that comes up. Um, we had a Welsh teacher like Welsh language teacher, who would um, repeatedly talk about uh, the new gypsy planning camp that's being made, like, around the corner from where she lives, which either, I don't know, I mean, it would always be in reference to me. Like, it, it was either, like, she was just talking about that all the time and she had this obsession, or more likely, every time I'm in class, she'll talk about it. And then the class set would even be, like, um, write a letter to your local councillor in Welsh would be the the example you had to do. And then she'd be like, right. And would start off with this example of, uh, <laughs> dear Sean, my, my local uh, constituents, as you know, and she'll talk about that. Um, but yeah, the the first time I had like something major was not in Britain. Um, I went on a <laughs> university trip to Romania as part of this archeological thing I was working on. Um, and there, I mean, I'd been working all summer out in the sun, much darker than I am now, but not like fully Roma dark or anything. Um, and then when we were there for about a month, we worked pretty much dawn till dusk out in a field. Uh, so I went like a darker skin colour than I've ever been in my life. And I, was, I came back and all of my like full Romani family were like, what's this? What's this new guy's turned that? Uh, but there, as it got to a certain point, it was like a, a tipping point, like the, uh, like a Simpsons color chart, you know what I mean? It's like a, how dark is okay kind of, um, where I must have crossed into something that, that didn't look like Romanian anymore. And because in Romania, there aren't, there is no diversity. In Britain, this would never happen. There's too many other types of people. There, if you are not white Romanian, there's only other one thing you can be. So it's like kind of a bipolar thing. Um, and then I started like seeing like, real sort of discrimination that was like uh we'd go through we were in this tiny village as well in, near Timisoara um we'd be in like the van going to the site and they'd see me and thing and to be fair like a shirtless with a bandana I did kind of look the sort of <laughs> the stereotype but they'd release the dogs after you and the kids would throw stones at the van um the bar where we were drinking it's like someone's living room with a fridge in it uh, we'd be there pretty much every night after work. Um, the German guys who ran the dig were there. Uh, and the one time I went in, actually on the uh, 8th of April, um, it was Roma Day, and there was celebrations in Bucharest on the television. And the owner of the bar was looking at it, and I was just watching the television. And he looks at me, and, Sigan, and like points at me. And I was like, oh no, I don't know what you're talking about, you know. And the entire room goes quiet, and he sort of goes, um, doesn't really speak English, uh, your family um, uh, gas showers. And that was like, I mean, which obviously my family weren't, we're British, but I would never had anything like, no one would ever say that to anyone in the UK unless you're like an EDL guy. Um, and then pointed to the door, so I pretty hastily left, because, um, you know, I'm in like a room full of Romanian men in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and to be fair, actually, the German guy who ran the dig, I told him about it. He sort of storms back in and says, you know, if he doesn't drink here, no one drinks here. And then he became this um, 
this sort of faux paternalistic, like, oh, I'm sorry, I'll buy you a free drink and sit down, I didn't realise. Um, yeah, going into Timisoara was the same, shops wouldn't serve us. Uh, it was like a whole sort of eye-opening, like, never had anything remotely like that. Been re- refused in pubs a few times in the UK, but only if I'm with, like, a group. Like, on my own, just for, like, the look of you, that was nothing that never happened to me before. Mm. All right, so, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, so from there, Jonathan, you start working at the European Roman Rights Centre, and we're going to uh, drill down into the work that you're doing there. But now that you do have this platform, um, I mentioned in the intro some of the the impact of anti-Gypsyism, the, the you know the issues of of life expectancy, education. But give us a sense of the scale of this discrimination. You, you've hit you well. You haven't hinted at it. You've given us this anecdote there of, of of what can happen to you on a personal level. But give us a sense of how ingrained anti-Gypsyism is and and what its impact is on the traveller and Roma community across Europe. Uh, okay. Um, so anti-Gypsyism is defined as the specific racism directed against Roma, Sinti, travellers. Manush, Egyptians, anyone who's stigmatized as a gypsy in the public imagination. Um, the term gypsyism was specifically used because it's so widely recognizable. It doesn't necessarily apply that there is a gypsyism, which is anti to, um, but it's something you kind of need to say because there are a lot of groups, especially in the Western Balkans, um, protest the term gypsy whatsoever. So when you're talking about anti gypsyism, it's not referencing that the gypsy exists in any way. Um, it's hard to find the origins um, of something like anti-Gypsyism because it has literally grown with European societies. It's not something that is extra. It is a component part of European societies for the last half a millennium. Um, it's an, it's like a an, an inheritance that all of Europe has. It is part of all of us. Um, so discrimination against Roma is not just racism in that sense. Um, when we talk about anti-Gypsyism as a concept, it is uh, it's the, the, the scale of it which truly sets us apart. Um, when Roma first arrived in Europe in 14th century as outsiders, um, we first had these stereotypes of any outsider group beginning. Um, these get compounded century after century, so anti-Gypsyism has become uh, more amorphous as time has gone on. It's now are much more com- the stereotype of the gypsy is more complex than at any point in history because of this way of it, it gets comp- compounded with each century that passes. So racism, which wouldn't happen against other groups, becomes completely normalized. Um, you get it results in systems of discrimination. You get the unequal access to clean water, to safe housing, um, spatial segregation of Roma from non-Roma uh, in really stark terms, particularly in, say, eastern Slovakia and Romania, uh, drastically, drastically lower life expectancy across the board, extreme unemployment, um, uh, a Dickensian level, I would say, of infant mortality, um, combined with what, like, institutional prejudices in the police, uh, the judiciary, government, social care systems, border control, like immigration, health services, it, it results in a, um, it's so endemic, it's a, a fundamental condition in sort of Europe's uh, collective psyche that sees them as gypsies and therefore on a basic level less than us. I'd say it's the, the crux of anti-gypsyism. Um, so yeah, as I said before, when we talk about um, inclusion a lot, um, it's kind of a a word that bothers me a bit, um, but I've not really been able to come up with a, a short or more usable term. So, um, Inclusion efforts often don't look at this root cause of anti-Gypsyism in the first place. Um, like if a, a Romani neighbourhood on the edge of a town uh, has no access to water and electricity, say, uh, it's not part of the, the actual municipality the line draws here, um, and the authorities and service providers refuse to connect them, this isn't the fault of one racist, racist municipality. It's not the fault of one water company. Um, it's a, a collective 
system that has allowed it to get to this point. Uh, similar with school segregation. Um, we have increasingly worse school segregation in Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary, which the European Commission is currently infringing those countries on for breaching the racial equality directive. Uh, if a Romani child is kept separate from non-Roma, this isn't one teacher that's doing that. Um, it's pretty unlikely to be. Uh, it's the result of seen and unseen uh, persecutions, exclusions, which have allowed and maintained such a system to exist whereby this child can be the end result. Um, and even to the point where we can still have people arguing whether segregation of Roma is maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing, that is the root of the problem. Um, that is the barrier to inclusion. But why? You said Roma have been here since the, since the 14th century. There are examples, and, and they're trotted out all the time. Yes, Jewish people have suffered persecution. Uh, black people have suffered persecution as well. If you look in Malaysia, the Chinese and minority group, they've suffered persecution, or certainly the contempt of the majority. If you look at Asians in East Africa, they've also suffered the contempt of the majority. What is it about the Roma experience in Europe that makes it so enduring, so established? I mean, I've, I've heard... You've heard the same things too, that the, the, the spread of Roma people around Europe was facilitated, certainly in, in initially, by the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. And so there was this uh, association by populations in Europe of the Roma people and the Ottoman invader, so to speak. And because they were a darker skin, perhaps darker hair, it was easy to spot them. But my goodness, that's three, four centuries ago. Why on earth is it still so virulent now? I mean, it's, it's as I said, so to go into more detail, you have, uh, say, 15th century, um, what's now Romania, this area. Um, Roma have been there now for about a hundred years. They first arrived, as you say, dark hair, dark skin, dark eyes. No one looks like them in Europe. It's a very white place. Stereotypes form half of the entire population of Roma that entered Europe are enslaved first out um, and weren't. Uh, there was no, uh, what do you call it? End of slavery. Um, abolition. Abolition. Uh, for 500 years. Uh, slavery finished in, I think, 1868, which means we are large groups in Eastern Europe where the large population of Roma are, are still, what, four generations away from chattel slavery? Um, I don't mean like serfdom, like all of Europe was under at some point or another, like literally buying and selling people as property, the same as the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and yet in Romania, for instance, and even countries where these Roma moved out from, um, they're often called Bayash now, are uh, the descendants of slaves. There's absolutely no educational, there's no curriculum which involves uh, Roma in slavery at any level. It's only most, I've met so many Romanians who when they get to university, they start digging and they find this out. And you think what that does to a society, it, it's, it means that you have this image of Roma as being, they've always been here, they've always been lazy, they've always been work shy, they've always been poor, which is a big thing. I think people just assume, like Roma and poverty are like synonymous things. Um, so you end up like, and then the other half that have moved to Western Europe, uh, they, they start filling a niche in society. Um, and as you say, throughout the centuries, lots of horrible things happen to Roma, lots of horrible things happen to Jews, um, depending on various political machinations and changes throughout the time. But what you don't have is Roma occupying this middle class, which I think a lot of other migrant groups managed to achieve we didn't, uh, I don't know, well, largely, to a large extent, we didn't occupy business owner roles, we didn't occupy landowner roles, um, middle management even, things like that. We were well, very why much... Why not? Uh, at the time we arrived in, like, medieval Europe, this was the niche that a group can form. Uh, compared to 
and even compared to Jews, Jews were here a lot longer than us. Um, and there was some example. So in pre-war Germany, they had, Sinti had uh, begun to achieve this level of, we had a middle class, we had a literary class. Um, there were officers in the German army in the First World War. Uh, there's a famous example of a Romani officer being led to, I think, Birkenau, uh, and he's protesting on the train. I'm a, a decorated war veteran um, who served his country. He was very, they were proud Germans. There was similar to Jews at the time. We had this Romani class. The difference is that after the Holocaust in Central and Western Europe, um, our entire middle class was wiped out, so small as it was. Um, as well as a lot of our oral traditions, even our written traditions, songs, uh, and then the memory of this Holocaust was wiped out, unlike other groups in the Holocaust where this almost became an identity-forming uh, process for them in post-war um, Europe. Uh, Anti-Semitism is very differently viewed today as anti-Gypsyism, I think in a large part because of the horrors of the Second World War. Uh, for Roma... We again, it's the same as the post-slavery example. We have a group of people who you have all of these this weight of historical stereotypes of being itinerant, of being lazy, of being poor. Uh, you have no broad knowledge that um, what between five hundred and one and a half million Roma are genocided, um, and especially in Central and Eastern European countries, you're talking well in excess of fifty percent of the populations. You're talking 80-90% in many countries. In some countries, the entire population is wiped out, and the Roma that are there now have moved from other countries. So no awareness of that means you don't get this sort of... Uh, this part of your identity of never again that comes with, say, uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, the middle class that we once had is now completely gone, so we don't even see... Uh, these kind of role models that other minority groups have, uh, where there's no, at least to the majority population, there's no Romani entertainment stars who are huge, no sports people, uh, even businessmen, business people, politicians. There's a small amount. So Caresma is a footballer, for instance, for Portugal. Uh, he suffers constant discrimination in the leagues he plays in. Uh, and I'm not saying that, I don't know, I'm reluctant. There's a sort of a tendency to think that there is a, something about Romani culture that leads to us being discriminated for so long. Uh, the nature that uh, how this discrimination has grown with Europe means that anything, all of the, the acts of discrimination, how they reflect on Roma. So the fact that forced evictions, everything that goes wrong now becomes sort of feed for it. It's a, a circle this loops back into the discrimination that we'd already felt before. Um, and yeah, you get, it mutually reinforces itself. If someone is forcibly evicted, they're then poor again. They're forcibly evicted because of institutional racism. The poverty feeds back into racism itself, but the root cause is still discrimination, and it's still based on centuries of this building up. Um, in a way that's completely unique, I think. I, I can't think of another group, certainly not in Europe, possibly elsewhere in the world. Um, the closest example that's often drawn is the civil rights movement in America, uh, where I think where we are now is very similar to where the civil rights movement would have been in the early 20th century. Uh, but even then, like, in the early 20th century in America, you had black jazz singers, black blues singers, black crooners. Um, there was a niche there. And it was a, more of a segregationist mentality that a lot of people kind of think they're okay, but they live here and we live here. It was a, a black and white. A lot of it was kept separate. Um, it's not so explicit in Europe. It's just as segregated, if not more so, but it's done through more modern institutions. It's done through the, the distribution of capital. It's done through... Uh, where you set development projects, it's done through white flight, it's done through uh, where you fund uh, municipality projects for better schooling and things like that, on a very sort of micro level compared to the civil rights movement. So I'm not sure, like, I would never try to 
push the civil rights analogy too much, as a lot of people do, especially with school segregation. Um, but no, it does seem, you're right, it's a, a unique persecution compared to a lot of the world's minorities. I will be pushing the civil rights analogy later on in our conversation, Jonathan. But um, <laughs> you, you, you speak with Roma and travellers. What do they make then of, of the situation and, and how they should confront it? Is it just uh, one? Is it just an attitude of resignation, of acceptance? Because the, the, one of the stereotypes, and I'm going to—I think it's important that we discuss that. One of the stereotypes about Romani, uh, Roma and traveller people is that, contrary to uh, what people expect, uh, Roman travellers are considered to be quite passive, and and so the weight of history, all the things that you've detailed there, the response has been well, well. A kind of shrugging of the shoulders, just get on and live. Is that really the case, or are you hearing, uh, are you seeing greater militancy, uh, a willingness to confront this this quite dreadful persecution? I mean, yes and no. So, according to Fra research, um, eighty percent of Roma in Europe live in deep existential poverty. So. That's a huge mass of, when we talk about Roma, um, who are so concerned with the daily existence of surviving that, like, notions of, I don't know, passivity and things like that are kind of out the window when you're literally hungry. I think most people don't realize the depth of poverty that Roma live in in Europe. They are, sure, you see begging in streets and whatever, and that's kind of the, as far as the Gaja view of this goes. Um... If you're especially in Albania, um, areas of Romania, Eastern Slovakia, uh, there's poverty I think most Europeans uh, would be shocked to find exists within Europe. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the passive attitude, if people are thinking, oh, is this discrimination? If all you have ever known, you can't read, you can't write, you've probably barely ever seen anyone, if you're in these communities, who is not Romani. When you do, they're either enforcing something, they're an authority's representative, or they're police who, like, could do all sorts of, like, truly horrific things to you, or it's so random in their acts of violence that that is, that's like a, a wild animal coming into your environment. Um, but at the same time, there is, we are now sort of starting to rebuild... I guess what you could call a Romani middle class, um, by most class definitions, no, but if you compare uh, a lot of Roma who have finished school, who have gone to university, to the mass uh, population, then this is the middle class. Um, and they're going back to their communities a lot of the time, uh, and bringing back ideas of sort of uh, community organizing, uh, sort of grassroots development work, um, especially in arts, actually. Um, Romani arts for a long time, although we're known as musicians and artists, were kind of not really displayed other than secondarily in European public life. Um, although much of European great arts owes a lot of its existence to Romani works, it was never really acknowledged publicly. Um, but now we see... Um, there's a guy in Albania who does lots of protest art, um, Sead, Kazanjiu, with uh, Romani communities there. And they are getting, I mean, right in like the public square in Tirana, they are putting up illegally these huge public um, displays, I think wagon wheels and things of forced evictions, um, building like houses and it's protest art right in the center of the city. Um, and that is, I think, says something about Roma resistance that it's easy to characterize as passive, but it's never violent resistance. It's always been um, an expression rather than a violent uprising, apart from very small examples, which goes against the stereotype of Roma criminality, Roma violence. Um, we have this, what's it called, AREAC, this Institute of um, Romani Arts and Culture. In Berlin. Yeah. Uh, so this is when we were talking about trying to build like a a consciousness of what it is to be Romani before you can have some sort of uh, 
movement which takes in Roma other than the educated and the middle class. Uh, and this, the Ariac is the first space really, I think, ever uh, dedicated to exploring what it is to be Romani in Europe. Um, as I think I, from my own background earlier, um, we're often quite ignorant of our own histories, our own identities, um, because of centuries of persecution, cultural whitewashing, and it is important to um, to understand that yes, we came from India like so long ago, it doesn't matter, but we are Europeans. Um, and for most Roma, especially in these really segregated settlements, this doesn't exist in their mind. Um, I don't like to talk about the Roma mind, but for a lot of people, uh, you're simply taught that you are just an inferior type of person to the majority society. It's not something you'd ever question. Um, the head of our organization, Georgi Ivanovic, was talking about this when I saw you in Strasbourg, actually. Um, that He said, growing up, when you're about five years old, you realize um, that you're somehow different from everyone else. And there's no reasoning and no other explanation to you of why that is, other than the version of events that the majority decided to give you. Um, everyone you know is poor and uneducated, so you start to believe this racist narrative. You believe that you are a gypsy. Uh, so then, at five years old, you have to make the decision uh, to either hide this or to try and conform to the majority um, and accept it, or you have to somehow try and reason an alternative explanation at the age of five when nothing is available in this sense. So we're talking about that level of cultural ignorance of our own people, um, especially in Eastern Europe where in communism and post-communism the, the state or the majority narrative is that is it. There is no... Even my, like I remember my grandfather, not in communist, but like uh, he doesn't believe that we are descended from India originally. He sees it as a theory, but like because in Britain, um, originally we were called Egyptians, that's, that's the idea he has, that, uh, yeah, you know, we came through Egypt at some point, and Spain, and then we ended up in Wales, and somewhere in between, it got a little bit fuzzy, but that's how it is. Um, and he's, I mean, he's a brown man, right? He's not, doesn't look like me, but he will insist that he is a white man. Uh, like, if we go in the UK, if we go to a an Indian restaurant for a takeaway, someone will, they sometimes start talking to him in Hindi. And he's like, no, no, and he's got this like watch strap here where he keeps it on all the time. And he pulls it back to show this little white band to be like, look. And it's, it's this, this culture of, um, it's post-colonial, I suppose. It's uh, phenomenal, there's something to say about it. But like, the further east you go, the more that becomes, you accept this dominant narrative. Let's go into that um, dominant narrative around Roma and travellers. Now, when I speak with people who are who are not Roma, you hear so many of the of the myths and stereotypes that, in many ways, fuel curiosity, but also fuel this quite terrible racism that we've already discussed. So, for example, and you've nailed it already, uh, Roma people are mostly nomads, or Roma and travellers parents they don't see the value of education. These are the kind of pernicious myths and stereotypes that are out there. Give me some others, Jonathan, that we can nail right here and now. Okay. Um, so literature is a good place to start. They always end up in uh, literary cliches. We become like a, a trope of theatre, songs, literature. Um, so I wrote an article roughly about this. There's broadly two stereotypes, or all stereotypes can broadly fit into two of uh, Romani people. Um, those being the, the dirty scoundrel and the romantic free spirit. These are, we can only be these two things. Um, so the gypsy scoundrel depicts a character that's built on uh, years of distrust between the Roma and non-Roma communities. Uh, so the essential premise is that we are a vagrant race of thieves, uh, con artists, freeloaders, baby snatchers, um, materially poor by ethnicity, um, and often similar to stereotypes of Jews, um, like obsessed with the acquisition of money. That's like a thing that uh, lots of like racist nursery rhymes often have. The gypsy trying to sort of like con you into buying something or sell something at a lower price or try and get more than it's worth um, at the expense of someone else. Um, there's a common element of uncleanness, uh, both in the theoretical and physical sense. Gypsies are dirty. 
Um, so you think of like characters um, in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Victor Hugo, the circus master in that. Um, he is a the classic gypsy scoundrel, um, Stromboli and Pinocchio. We're going to go into Disney ones. Um, and then conversely, you have this romantic free spirit, um, which can somehow be equally deployed. You can both be uh, a dirty thieving gypsy while also being like a sexy seductress who steals gadget men or whatever. Um, and these are kind of so the gypsy romantic version is a, a fierce, rebellious, kind of this anachronistic existence, um, wild, sexy, exotic, like Esmeralda and Victor Hugo, uh, Carmen, Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights. Uh, but importantly, all of these stereotypes are controlled uh, by the non-Romany world and colour how people interact with Roma in the real world. Uh, you even get, especially in the UK and also in some parts of Romania and Spain, uh, the Romany identity is kind of taken away from Romani people and then used in its own right as a way of insulting someone, um, which happens with homo homophobia a bit too. So that if you want to draw a comparison, it happens in literature too, with something that is dark, dangerous, a bit off, you can use stereotypes of gypsies when there are no gypsies present and it conveys meaning based on this kind of psychological response that you have to the idea of these stereotypes. Um, you get it in football a lot, for instance. Uh, Andy Carroll in the English Premier League gets called Gippo all the time because he has long hair. He's not he's not a traveller, he's not Romany. Um well so, um uh, England player, Wayne, Rooney, um same. Either Shrek or it gets called Pikey because he's from Liverpool. Like I mean he's part Irish. Liverpool people are supposed to have this thing about stealing and another stereotype that's literally taking various negative stereotypes, putting them into a gypsy one, and that just covers it all, and everyone knows exactly what you mean because of this build-up over time. Um, when you take that outside of sort of stereotypes and literature um, and look at how that works in a political environment, um, you end up with hate speech across the board from, I mean, from, like, prime ministers of member states, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary when um, when the EU were, he was trying to refuse these he did refuse these refugee quotas uh, his response was to compare Roma to Syrian refugees because that was a cultural sort of landmark that people can then grapple on to um, he said something paraphrased uh, like Hungary's historical sort of condition is that we live with a few hundred thousand Roma uh, and this was decided by someone somewhere, but uh, we've inherited this. This is now our situation. We have to live with it. But, you know, we don't demand that anyone else has to live with lots of Roma. That's something that we Hungarians do. Uh, and he's just utilized Roma there as being like some sort of parasitic infection, which you don't want to come in the same as Syrian refugees for him. Um, so now ex-Prime Minister Robert Fico of Slovakia said on national television um, the great mass of Roma want to just lie in bed on social support and family benefits. They realize that having children is advantageous. Um, I could go on. There's so many. Bulgaria, for instance, um, Valery Simeonov, the deputy prime minister, he compared uh, Roma as being brazen, feral, human-like creatures. Their women are like pigs on the street and have the instincts of stray bitches. He was then appointed Minister for Integration and Minority Issues, like, not long after that. Uh, local NGOs taken to court, uh, he's convicted of hate speech, there's no implementation, um, and Bulgaria now uh, holding the presidency of the Council of the EU. So what we've got then is a kind of cultural stereotypes, reinforced political discourse, and it's just this, <laughs> this, this constant loop. Well, I hope now that we can consign all of those to the rubbish bin of history. Let's move on to the work that you're doing for the European Roma Rights Centre. Sum up exactly what you're trying to do then, because from the outsider, we could say, well, why is this 
why is this work to improve the condition and situation of, of Roma people not being done within the community? Why does such a such an organization exist? The European Roma Rights Centre is a law organization, human rights law firm, first and foremost. Um, so we try to fight anti-gypsyism using the justice systems, both national and international. Um, we practice something that's called strategic litigation, where which actually we got largely um, from the civil rights movement in the US. Yeah, it, it feels so much like the NAACP, as you say, in the 1920s, yeah, so, you know. Yeah, we were formed, I think, partially in the image uh, of the NAACP. Um, we were founded by American activists working at Open Societies Foundation, uh, as well as some local... Um, I think we've had this general view for quite a long time of being um, quite a white, quite a non-Romany, fairly elitist, top-down organization, which is partly because of the way our work is. We do operate on a national and international level. We're not a community organization. We're not working with people in settlements and stuff like that. Uh, and also until what, last year, two years ago, we all were almost an entirely non-Romany staff base. Everyone involved was. Um, partly because of political climate in Europe, I guess, at the time. Uh, and also simply that until recently, there just hasn't been the Romani who have the education and the talent or have been brought the talent forward to work in human rights law. That's changing now. We have, we're a predominantly Romani organization. We're Romani-led. Um, we have several Romani lawyers. Which before, that wasn't something that just didn't happen. Um, and we did, I think because we're kind of a victim of success in that because we've got so large now people often criticize us for not doing community work we all uh they ask why aren't you using all that money you have to feed roma in this place or why aren't you why are you spending money on hosting a conference that costs thousands of euros when you could do this instead um and we were, we were never meant to be this this catch-all that is to solve what people like to call the roma problem which I hate also, it's not a minority issue, but um, it's a societal problem. We were always intended to be a tool of human rights. We're part of a coalition, a Roma movement, which are all have the same goal, being the emancipation of Roma in Europe. Uh, litigation is a potent tool in that arsenal. Um, it has relatively direct effects um, compared to, I don't know, general sort of policy ad advocacy, we, our legal director says we, we sue racists, we take racists to court. It might take a while, but it's a much more direct form of human rights work. Uh, but it can't work on its own. Um, we need to have that community support. And I mean, we do have, to some degree, we have Romani people who are taking their cases to courts and we're doing it on their behalf. So obviously we have uh, outreach with these communities. We we are trying to get Roma to believe, to understand that the law can be a tool you can use. Um, the problem we're starting to see now, and fairly recently, but I guess it's always been a thing, um, is that often national courts, um, domestic courts, say, are not adequately providing justice to Romani litigants who bring their human case, human rights abuses before them. Um, so often we have to spend years and years fighting through the national court system in a country before we can get it to the European Court of Human Rights um, and then show them domestic remedies have failed. So biases in the domestic court system is something that's hindering our work and it takes litigants longer to get a decision and be granted justice, which is something that you have to be very upfront about. You have to manage expectations. We don't want to like convince people that you can go to court and get a, a settlement straight away. It does take time. The strategic element is that if we take these cases in areas where there is discriminatory structures in place and we can use a court case to challenge and dismantle that structure, it has a top-down effect on so many other people who would have been victims of the same structure. Uh, for instance... Uh, an inordinate number of young Romani men in their 20s are dying in Macedonian prisons, either through direct 
causes by prison guards or through negligence. We don't really know, we can't say if it's either, but it's strange that lots of 20-somethings are dying of drug overdoses when they shouldn't be able to access the methadone in the police, in the prisons. Um, and it's not something that's matched with non-Roma population. So what we're doing there, we will take a collective complaint of all of these cases together and sue the Ministry of Justice, sue the prison service, and say, look, this is an institutional racism problem. If we can't solve it there, we try and put this before the European Court of Human Rights, who will have a judgment come down. What would you point to as being the successes of strategic litigation? Uh, in Europe or in general? In Europe, in Europe and in general. Um, so, let's look at... Uh, the, you know, Brown versus the Board of Education in the United States. Classic one, yeah. Yeah, so that is the case that's often held up as being kind of the watershed case for desegregation of black kids from white kids in America. Um, the European example was one of our cases called uh, DH versus the Czech Republic, or DH and others versus the Czech Republic, uh, which was the first major desegregation case in Europe. Uh, since then, we've had pretty much, there's been a DH for lots of other countries. There's been a Slovak DH, a Greek one, a Hungarian one, a Croatian one in most of the segregating countries around Central Europe. Um, the success being, the case is successful. It set a precedent that segregation is illegal in those countries. Um, it's also set kind of narratives around it that people now talk about it that it is like an illegal practice you can't segregate from any kids from non-roma whereas before that didn't happen it was just considered normal um what it hasn't done is end segregation um in fact segregation has got worse i'd argue since then uh but that's not necessarily a failure of strategic litigation what dh did as well as other lobbying was get the european commission to launch an infringement procedure to take legal action against say the czech republic for dh um, which is the, the height of the legal action that we can hope for as a, a human rights law firm. Since infringement, we've seen in Slovakia, at least, I think in the Czech Republic, segregation materially getting worse, in Hungary, definitely. Um, and this kind of links to a... I mean, th these were victories for strategic litigation. The problem we get is, in terms of access to justice, it's a wider problem of these countries rather than of Roma rights. Um, when judgments are not being implemented, for us as a law firm, that leaves us no legal recourse to turn to and solve it. Um, so we're, then, we're talking about a, a breakdown in rule of law then when it comes to human rights cases. It's not just um, a case of Roma rights. This is literally the judicial system is not working. It's a problem with the very democracy of a country, not just how they treat Roma. I hear what you say, Jonathan, but there, there are other things here. It Again, I know you don't like these comparisons with the civil rights movement in the United States, but I think they could be useful for our conversation. There was a use of strategic litigation to challenge some of the key pillars of segregation in the United States. That was also matched by a growing willing, willingness amongst important constituencies in black America to challenge, challenge segregation outside of the legal process. So you got the emergence of the Christian movement and the attempt, the civil rights movement and the marches. And this created a momentum and created uh, the conditions whereby uh, segregation could be overturned in a, in a sort of a 15, 20 year period. We're not seeing that in Europe. So why not in your analysis? We're getting desegregation of individual pockets. Um, we've got several cases where we've successfully desegregated but like the civil rights movement, we're having the similar problem of white flight, which is something you can't litigate as easily. Um, the way we deal with it is that... So okay, but explain, explain the importance of white flight. I think I understand it, but just, just explain how, how crucial that is. Yeah, so even if we desegregate a school and say that uh, you have to integrate, because before they have like a literal separate school where Romani are educated from the white school. Um, so we abolish that with a court case. What happens then is uh, non-Romani parents 
and they should have the right to, don't me wrong, they have the right to choose where their child goes to school, uh, will gradually withdraw children from that school. And there seems to be a tipping point when the school gets, varies by region, say like, I don't know, 50, 60% Romani, when it starts to get too Romani for uh, non-Roma parents, uh, the scales go completely like that becomes then a Roma school or a Roma area. Uh, so you get de facto oh, segregation. People moving out of the area, people literally will leave that place, which increases the idea, uh, increases the prevalence of uh, Roma representation in that school. But okay, let me let, let me push back on that. The objective is that Roma children have access to schooling. The objective is not that they sit in in school next to uh, non Roma children. Yeah, but what we're seeing is. Uh, Segregated schooling of Roma is they're often an inferior education. We see a lot of the time in uh, Hungary, particularly, Romani kids will finish their secondary school without being able, barely being able to read. Uh, in Czech Republic and Slovakia, this manifests as they're placed in what they call special classes or special schools, uh, where at the assessment stage, Roma are incorrectly diagnosed with having um, mental disabilities and learning difficulties which put them into this stream for like special education uh, which means that they're offered an education which is far inferior to their non-Roma counterparts it also means that their, ex their excuse is that oh, we have Roma who come to us and when they start they can't read um, so we put them in what they call zero classes to try they call like catch-up classes um, but these are catch-up classes where no one ever catches up. It's uh, the gap actually gets wider the longer you're in these catch-up classes. Um, also, the idea of segregating people by pretty much any um, measure has never really been proven to be successful anywhere in the world. Segregation is never, a, a, in like pedagogical terms, is not a good way of teaching people. Um, even with these um, these special schools, that they call them. Uh, most research points actually that children with learning difficulties would learn better with children without, and vice versa. Uh, so even that argument is void from the start. I think there's also a quite an interesting situation where children of Romani origin have left Slovakia, gone to the UK, I think at Sheffield, gone into yeah. mainstream education and flourished. So, mm -hmm. so I hear that. But on this point of, of what happens when more and more Romani children go to school alongside non-Romani children, do you have evidence, Jonathan, of states, national authorities, local authorities, reducing the services and the funding of these schools once they start to integrate more and more Romani children? Because if, if, if the schools maintain the level of funding, maintain the level of service, they keep the teachers, then hopefully state education of, of Roma children should be of a similar quality to uh, state education of non-Romani children elsewhere. Yeah, no, what you find is um, at regional and local authority um, funds often they have a discretion of how their funds are spent. Uh, so uh, sort of excuse we hear quite a lot from when we meet with national and central things that it's not us, it's the local authority doing this. We've told them how it should be, we've given them their budget, uh, and it's still, they're spending it how they like. So partly it's, it, it feeds into this wider system, it's not one thing, you know, it's never as simple as that. Um, you have local administrators deciding where funding should go. You also have teachers deciding where they want to teach and the best teachers don't want to teach in the Roma school, obviously. You also get teachers who are institutionally, not necessarily racist, but biased. Uh, it's not always um, the case of that they're, you're, you're a sort of demon-like, stereotypical racist who's not teaching them anything and beating them or whatever. Um, uh, James Baldwin had similar, when he said he wrote about... Um, no, it wasn't. It was Malcolm X. Uh, when he was younger, uh, a very well-meaning white teacher told him not to go to university. Don't go in to do these things. You're better off going and learning to do a factory trade. 
And she didn't say that out of spite or prejudice, but of realism that she wants the best for this person. So the educators aren't necessarily the bad guys in this. They might be part of a racist system, but it's not always the fault of the educators. Um, in it's the, the culture of low expectations, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, things like uh, I've spoken to Romani girls in uh, Slovakia who were innocently forced down the track of you will do kind of like home ec, you will learn how to sew and go into the clothing factory because that's what all Romani women that they know do. And it's not necessarily a sense that uh, they want what's worse for these girls and they don't want them to go to university or, I don't know, play football or whatever else they wanted to do. It's that's the most likely as route for them to have some sort of livelihood in a society that is deeply racist, deeply prejudiced, and a lot Roma, a very specific role, or unemployment. In the preparation for this conversation, I looked at a site, I think you told me to look at this site, in fact, Jonathan, it's the Anti-Gypsyism EU. I'll put a link to the website uh, on, in the notes accompanying this uh, podcast. And it states on this website, the idea that promoting Roma integration is the main path to countering anti-Gypsyism is a fallacy that misconstrues the origins and essence of anti-Gypsyism. It inverts cause and effect. Now, I think that's quite a powerful statement because when I look at the work of most institutions, organizations who genuinely wish to improve the situation of Roma people, it's all based around, or Roma and travelers, it's all based around this notion of integration. Now, I think you've alluded to it earlier, but I think it's important. Do you agree with that statement, Jonathan? And if so, do you not think that that leaves many European organizations and policymakers with absolutely nowhere to go? since they are locked into this strategy of Roma integration. Yeah, when they say it inverts cause and effect, it's what I was talking about earlier when we say um, the symptoms of racism and the racism itself and which order they come in. So the idea that uh, people are racist against Roma because they are poor is not true. Roma are poor because people are very racist or because the system is very racist that's led to them being in this situation. Um, so taken out of con like it's quite a in-depth policy um, document. So taken as a whole, this term anti-gypsyism is something that the Alliance Against Anti-Gypsyism have been trying to get um, as the sort of the main starting point, the working definition for pretty much all international institutions as well as um, civil society, and they've been broadly successful. Um, I think the Council of Europe are using it, uh, a lot of the EU, the European Commission definitely use it. Um, but as a barrier to integration or inclusion, um, I don't know, I mean, the approach to everything needs that we can learn from, say, the decade of Roma inclusion would be um, a well-meaning thing that's said to have failed because it doesn't look at this root effect. Saying you've inverted the cause and effect is literally that. Um, the decade looked at improving literacy goals, health, closing the gap they had, it was of, between Roma and non-Roma. Um, whereas it very, very rarely looked at the root cause of these problems. Um, and that Do was you believe why do you believe, Jonathan, sorry to interrupt, but do you believe those root causes can be, can be effectively tackled? You talked earlier in this conversation about how it's, it's centuries old, it's deeply rooted. Do you think that these, these root causes can be challenged? Can, can we close this gap? I mean, we have to believe that we can <laughs> uh, close this gap. If it's hard to like pick one area that has to sort of yeah. push for this. If we have better Romney representation, that's a great start. But if you look at America... There's black representation in all the arts and sports, yet there's still black men being shot in the street by police. It's not a... Often representation is something that's trotted out as like, oh, if only people could see our successes, then the racism would stop. It wouldn't. What we can do is... So ref are very much involved in this education. Creating Roma who are seen to be successful and outside of the stereotype is a part of it. What we do in legislating it if you make it illegal for people to do and say these things, it does have a knock-on effect. Um, it's a more sort of 
uh, say, conservative way of looking at it. Uh, what about creating more effective alliances? Uh, again, I know you don't like these comparisons with the civil rights movement, but I think that this, the link, certainly at the beginning, it's not the case so much now, but certainly in the beginning between black and Jewish groups, I think that was important. You widen the, the, the scope of the challenge and you show that it is a social issue. Do you think that Romani and traveller groups have been successful in in making the kind of effective alliances that will enable them to challenge discrimination? Because I put it to you that black Arab Asians have entered into Europe and in, in some cases have been able to create thriving middle classes and have access to levers of power that Roman communities now, Roman and traveller communities now, could only dream of. So what does that tell you and how can you build on that situation to advance the situation of Roman and traveller people? So yeah, we have broadly created some alliances with other, um, say, minority groups or with people working on anti-racism and those minority groups. Um, the European Network Against Racism is an example um, particularly with Islamophobia and anti-Gypsyism, there seems to be more of a link forming. Uh, the issue is part, kind of exactly what you said. Um, Roma issues, say, if you compare to the beginning of the decade, um, which was a very stable time for Europe in the early 2000s, there was no war close by, it was an economic boom, there were no refugees coming, minimal threat from terrorism, Everyone was kind of okay. So the political will uh, for the decade was very high. Everyone, it was high on the agenda. Everyone wants to help Roma. Not a lot of money in it, though. Um, if you look at after the decade, so from 2015 onwards, um, we have pretty much all of Northern Africa is in tribal conflict and like civil war. Um, all of the Near East is in warfare. Turkey is a growing concern for European Union in general, Russian encroachments on Europe, mass, the largest movement of people uh, since the Second World War of refugees trying to find safety in Western Europe, as well as since that time, the financial crash of 2008. Um, it's a very different uh, time that we're working in now. So political will to help to put Roma issues on the agenda is quite low now. But paradoxically, there's actually quite a lot of money for it um, compared to the beginning of the decade. So how do you, how do you push Roma uh, concerns to higher up in the list of priorities of policymakers and, and governments? At the European Roma Rights Centre. Um, so we have contacts within Brussels and Strasbourg who reach out to us for data a lot of the times the main like the day-to-day -day and how we keep in contact to push this up in policy agendas um which a lot of the time it's kind of it's a very slow burn advocacy technique that you start seeing in documents that come from the council of europe uh from the european commission especially and from various un um, committees our own language coming back to us literally sometimes even our own sentences are being fed back in. So they are taking heed of this. Um, they are like recycling information we give them. Um, and although we can't claim that we were responsible for infringement proceedings being taken against various countries, we certainly played a huge role in that. A lot of the data that they're getting is coming from organizations like us. Um, but if you compare this like to the, the perceived sort of threat in Europe from everything else that's going on, we've dropped down massively in that sense, um, especially with the rise of far right in Eastern Europe, even that's kind of taken precedent now above Roma issues, even though uh, politicians in Central and Eastern Europe are very much aware of the political gain they can get from scapegoating Roma, from using Roma as a, a political platform. Jobbik in Hungary, you could argue, built their entire political base on anti-Roma sentiment, sentiment. That was their main sort of uh, target for a long time. Now they've tricked everyone into thinking they're kind of the nice guys again. But, you know, it's still, if you look through that manifesto, it's the same thing. To try and get, for us to try and get Roma issues back up on this agenda is very difficult, uh, to be honest. Um, 
the odd sort of high profile thing we can get through in Britain is starting to a little bit more, I think. Um, but that's kind of because it's this renaissance of Romani and travel movements in Britain has taken hold of media of ma- imagination to a certain degree again. Um, it's interesting to have young Romani and traveler people having a voice for a media perspective. Also, cynically, every time you report on something Romani or traveler in mainstream news, you know you're going to get a good amount of hits to it because yeah, every problem. racist and their dog is going to be there like, ah, they parked down the road next to me and they wouldn't move and blah, blah, blah. So, like, Dale Farmer. Yeah, it is a huge challenge to keep it on somewhere on the agenda. Um, to a large degree, it's a little out of our control where it moves within that. But it is now. It's not going to go back to the time of the 1990s where we have um, ethnic killings with automatic rifles and it doesn't even make the papers. You know, that, that's not going to happen again. It's, it is moving forward. I think we've talked about this earlier in the conversation, but I think we can focus on it now. Some black activists, Jonathan, talk of the black experience in America, Cuba, Jamaica and Brazil as reflecting what they call a post-traumatic slave disorder. So what they, they, they say that the behavior of the descendants of slaves in these countries and perhaps elsewhere is heavily influenced by the all-encompassing, brutalizing, and demoralizing impact of slavery. Could you apply that same understanding to what we see in Roma, Roma and travelers' communities today in Europe? Uh, in Romania, yes, 100%. Um, so you think in, it's valid, then, this notion of post-traumatic slave disorder? You think that's a, yeah, a valid yeah. concept? Um, like, you're talking about slavery that's happened for a half a millennium, so the people who were enslaved then, it's not just, it's a condition of existence. It would be very similar to slavery in America, that it's not just, you know of a time, you don't know of a time when you weren't enslaved in that sense. Everyone, what, like 30 generations behind you was enslaved. Often your language is destroyed. All of your cultures, you are just rendered as a, a brown other of uh, Moldova and Wallachia at the time. Uh, then you have... 1868, I might be wrong on the date, abolition comes. But for another, what, 50 years, a lot of the slaves go back and work for their previous landowners because what else are they going to do? They work instead now for um, food and board. Um, And it means, oh, and also that the state made them pay their worth back to their landowners also. So like any wage they did receive for however long after paid the cost of them losing this slave. Um, so that brings you up to roughly 1900, when these are the people who were freed slaves. You're then a few generations away um, in a communist government where Ceausescu utilizes like a, this idea of like a, a Roma workforce. He wanted these like Roma automatons. They were going to be the lumpen proletariat who work the factories, work the land. They were like the fodder for the machine to keep running. Um, which in a very different way blanketed the culture, blanketed any notion of slavery. Um, And I I hear lots of going to Romani communities in these poor areas of Romania, often they'll tell me it was so much better under communism, which is I hear everywhere, because at least then everyone had a job, uh, everyone had food, everyone lived in a house, everyone went to school, everyone had access to hospitals. Uh, But what that's done is this sort of post-slavery hangover, if you like, um, is that there's been no, not even critical engagement with it. There's been, no one talks about it. There's no museum to the Romanian slavery. There's no, um, and actively Romanians, some Romanians will actively deny or attack it. Like I'm sure after this, we'll have someone messaging the RRC saying slavery never existed in Romania. And they might either mean it never happened at all, full stop, we didn't learn about it, or they might mean, oh, it happened in territories which previously were not Romania and you can't say that because of blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not even in books. Like that, That's something you can't really, you can't begin to make policy on how to deal with the effects of slavery after all this time if you don't even acknowledge it in the first place. Um, it's very similar to post-colonial studies in that sense, which is probably why they've used that analogy. 
How concerned are you, Jonathan, by an increasing willingness by some critics of Roma communities to claim that it's the pathologies and behaviour of the Roma community, Roma and traveller community itself, which are to blame for the current situation of Roma people in Europe? Uh, it's a tactic that's always been used by racists. It was the same as used in the 30s against Jews, that it was some sort of uh, innate condition of an ethnicity which leads to things that happen. Um, the same are used uh, to stereotype poor black communities in inner cities in the US and gang culture, that it's somehow a condition of being black in the US rather than something that's been created out of segregation and persecution. I hear what you say, but allow me just to, to put some of the points that they make. They, they look at the treatment of Roma women. They look at early marriage of young Roma girls. They look at other types of behavior and say, look, it's, it's when the community deals with these issues that it can then make the breakthrough that, that, uh, that you and I and others might want. You look at um, uh, early marriage, for instance, was something that happened across Europe until relatively recently. Um, the fact it still happens in some Romani communities, because it's often blanketed across everyone, that everyone has early marriage, everyone treats women badly, everyone, all sorts of things. The fact it's still happening in these communities is almost a marker of their um, exclusion. It, it's literally like a timeline that is behind Europe, um, that cultural practices like this can continue because of the segregation and systems of poverty around it. Um, not to excuse violence against women in Romani communities, this happens, but I had a, a girlfriend of a friend ask me before when she was asking about Romani stuff, she's like, oh, it's um, it's very patriarchal, isn't it? Romani, like traveler in Romani communities. I was like, no more so than your own. I've known the strongest women uh, throughout my family have uh, like often been Romani women for a long time. The person who led the family was this matriarch, uh, Nana Lee, we called her, who was used to beat her chest when she got angry and like terrify local men who'd come around. And she was a truly like strong, terrifying woman who was certainly not passive or a victim of Romani patriarchy or anything like that. Um, so it is often this this tendency from Gaji society to, I guess, with not just Romani but other. Uh, minority or indigenous groups to sort of pass these judgments as if from this place of absolute superiority that there's no violence being there's no rape culture in the west there's no uh systems like where women are pigeonholed into roles which are much more so i say often than in roma communities um these aren't generalizations that can be just washed over whole groups of people that easily I mean, yes, yeah, it's, it's true. Uh, you can track this blaming of the victim, but what again? Just to just to develop that point, these these critics, these people who 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 wouldn't claim to be racist, they would say, look, there are the descendants no of slaves. Yeah, nobody <laughs> owns up to that now. They they look at the descendants of slaves in the United States and elsewhere. They look at indigenous communities in Australia, and they look at the Roma and they say, look, these groups can be linked together. It's not an issue of resources. It's not an issue of changing laws. You can make all of these advances in welfare provision, access to services, education, etc., 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 and you won't get the kind of breakthroughs that you're looking for. It's a terribly bleak point of view. How, how do you rebut that totally, Jonathan? Firstly, in the claims that these advances have been made, um, we don't have access to healthcare, we don't have access to water, we don't have access to non-segregated schooling. What we're seeing is uh, sort of the vestige, the trimmings of it. It's like something that fills the what you need on paper for this, but in actuality, in all of our research, not just us, pretty much any research into any of these areas, yeah, broadly, will show significant lack of access for Romani people to most public services across particularly Eastern Europe. And this isn't because of uh, an unwillingness on behalf of Romani communities. This is an active symptom of persecution in these places. If we look at, we did a recent thing on statelessness um, in the Western Balkans. And one of the main things we heard from uh, like state officials and people involved with granting IDs 
was that it's part of Roma culture that they don't want to register. They don't want to, like, be on the system. Um, which, coming from Britain, I could actually see at the time. I was thinking, yeah, like, you know, we're always told never to put it on the census. You never want to register your ethnicity. You don't want to... My grandfather doesn't have a birth certificate. Like, um, But when we talked to these Romani communities that we were working with, 99% of them are desperately trying to get ID documents. Uh, to say that they're not aware of how having registration helps with their with their um, situation is insulting. Uh, they're acutely aware of how it affects them in that they can't register their kids in schools, and that they can't get a health card to get free health care, that they have to have backstreet abortions, that they have to have pregnancies in huts next to a river. Um, the fact that often some of these people are still refugees from Balkan wars who are still like third generation refugees who have not been registered and we've proven often this is active discrimination or using legal loopholes in countries legislation to deny Roma access to ID documents, to registration at health centers, getting their kids on the record so they can stay in a school system. This isn't something that's um, from, this is something that's imposed from the outside hugely. So to say that, like, uh, even if you get all of these accesses, there'll still be a problem? No. Roma communities across Europe are trying to access these things uh, and are being routinely denied by systems of discrimination. We're going to move now towards the end of this conversation, Jonathan. I'm going to be honest, I'm, it's been a quite a pessimistic conversation. The scale of discrimination is quite terrifying. The way in which anti-Gypsyism is, is sort of in the fabric of the European modus operandi, the way of doing things, the culture just seems to be, uh, it, 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 as I say, again, quite terrifying. However, uh, Jewish people were marginalised and chased from one country to another for centuries. Uh, if you'd have asked any black person anywhere in the world 25 years ago, would there be a uh, president with an African father in the White House? People would have laughed out loud. Yeah. So things can change human beings are capable of changing moving on from prejudice what are the circumstances in which current attitudes towards Roma people will change so I got asked this question or something like it quite a lot um, it's quite easy I think for people working within human rights uh, to be quite pessimistic um, we work day in day out with sort of the worst of humanity um and especially with roma rights we get setbacks a lot um in varying sort of areas like in segregation for instance we talked about things have actively got worse um in the time that a lot of people were working on it uh but if you look on i had to do the, uh, the rsc was 20 years old last year um so I did like a research project into the last 20 years of what happened throughout the time and comparing particularly what it was like um, in the mid to late 90s compared to the 20 year anniversary. Um, and taken over, as you say, if you ask someone 20 years ago about Barack Obama, taken over a 20 year period, you can start to see trends of things that are improving. Um, then we had, uh, you'd have pogroms of entire villages um, after the breakup of communism in a lot of Eastern Europe, where like whole villages would be burnt out of their homes. Um, Far-right gr groups would uh, attack families, kill Romani families, would go to court and get off with community service. And most of it would barely make the news. And if it did, it was like, this is what happens. Um, that would be unthinkable now to imagine that. So if you look at the I don't know, the Chorba killings in 2004, I think, uh, where neo-Nazis opened fire on a Romani family in Hungary, that was big news. People st were still talking about that. It's just as tragic as things happened in the 90s, but the narrative around it has changed. Um, and these are extreme examples, but if we look on like a, a micro scale, things that like how people perceive how it's okay to talk about Roma is starting to get slowly better. Um, 
Whereas before, if you'd said in the UK something about Jippo, Pikey, Gypped, things like that, that's just so normal. And it still is normalized, but what you'll now get is a smaller voice that does pop up saying, ooh, that's not, it's not really okay to say that, actually, mate. That's not like... Um, which is small, I know, but like that's such a, a huge... The, the idea that there would be any change, if you'd asked like, my grandfather's generation, would have been unthinkable that someone would consider it not okay in a public space to be racist against Romani people. Um, and we have had successes um, on like a broader scale. Um, we do have greater access to schooling in general, although it's segregated, but for a long time, a lot of Romani people just weren't in school. And that's something uh, I guess you could attribute to the modernizing of uh, newly democratic states in Eastern Europe quite a lot, that it's just an evolving democracy. Uh, but yeah, no, it was it was kind of nice to look back and see. Hang on, actually, we have we have achieved something. It's not all as doom and gloom as I thought it was. Um, particularly in the nineties, it looked really grim in the nineties. Like, especially there were these cases in um, Slovakia or Czech Republic, or I guess Czechoslovakia then, um, where you had uh, a Romani man was walking down the street, skinhead stopped in the car got out, beat him up near to death, got back in the car and then ran him over in the middle of the street in broad daylight. Um, it was recorded, it was taken to court. It's a, an obvious hate crime to murder. Uh, and all of them turned up in their 88 Nazi memorabilia and stuff at the court and all walked. One of them got like a custodial sentence of six weeks. Um, and there's so many cases like that that came up in my research. I was like, Wow, that's like, compared to now, we have, on hate crime particularly, come quite a long way. Um, what has happened, though, is that the normalization of hate speech, I think, uh, partly because of the internet um, and because of these sort of echo chambers that everyone operates in, has become much more, uh, it's like a megaphone put to it, uh, particularly in on the part of politicians before, I think, European politicians didn't necessarily realise the value of Roma as a, a political tool to rail people against. Um, and that's something that's been sort of 2000 onwards, really, to great effect. They've been using this. This podcast will come out to celebrate International Roma Day. How, how will you celebrate that day, Jonathan? Uh, I will be in the European Parliament for Roma Week which runs from the 7th or the 8th of April until the 12th of April uh, and is an opportunity for mainly young Roma uh, as a youth dimension from across, like, all over Europe and in and out of the European Union uh, to come to meet, to organise. We'll be hosting an event, uh, I think, on the 11th um, where we're talking about online campaigning, um, motivating young people in... Uh, community sort of grassroots campaigning and how to get them involved in litigation work, how to manage successful campaigns, um, knowing sort of which European institutions you can use for which, because I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand how the EU works. Um, it is it's quite multifaceted. A lot of people wouldn't realise where you can take if you have I don't know, the police arrest you for something because they've seen a Romney person in the area and they take you in for questioning for no reason. Most would not realise you can then take that to your equality body in your country. Um, you can go to your ombudsperson. It's very easy for people to do that without the help of organisations like us. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a, like a how to effectively manage your rights as a Romney person and how to campaign so that others can do this. Uh, will be the focus for our day on the 11th. On the 8th, I imagine I'll be attending something else that I don't have to manage myself. Um, probably eating. We normally have uh, a few of us go, so we normally will make various Romani foods and drinks from because we're quite an international office. Was, I think I'm the furthest west in Wales, but we've got Roma from 
France, Hungary, all of Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Turkey, um, with all the different food. So that's normally kind of a big part of it. But, uh, Sounds great. Is it, is it an important occasion amongst Roma people, Roma and travellers? Is there kind of a holiday atmosphere amongst Roma and traveller people? Is there a sense of celebration or is it just an opportunity to f- focus and concentrate minds? The latter, predominantly. It's more of, um, it's definitely a, a civil society thing. It's quite a, an international event. It was, um, so it often ends up being a, a human rights sort of campaigning focus. Um, but I mean, it does vary. Like in the UK, it's growing, as I said, with this youth component in the UK that people are now aware of it and they do hold celebrations, but it's not like an old thing. You know, it's not something that Roma across Europe are all celebrating. Uh, that said, um, I know in Romania and a lot of the Balkan countries, it is becoming more of a, an actual community thing that people do celebrate. Um, last year I was in Novi Sad in Serbia, in Serbia um, and they had like a Roma ball that we went to because we were invited, uh, which was all right. Like it was, you know, they had a Romani band playing, some music, some drinks. Um, bizarrely it was sponsored by like Serbian local government so there was this conspicuous table of politicians sitting in the middle uh, and yeah they played um, the Romani anthem or the thing that's accepted as the Romani anthem so yeah there is some growing community sense around this maybe in I don't know 20 years after it's been going for almost half a century then maybe it would be more of a thing but uh, traditionally no it's not normally it's more local days that Roma will celebrate. Um, Edelezi in the Balkans is roughly St. George's Day. Uh, so that's like a much bigger event. Uh, Baba Marta in Bulgaria is like the coming of spring. Um, in the UK, it often concentrates around horse fairs. So yeah, there's we've got our own days in different countries that normally would rather celebrate. But uh, What would be your message to Roma and Roman travellers and non-Roma and travellers on this day, Jonathan? To non-Roma, um, I would say this is it's not your responsibility. This is something that you can be an ally to. Um, you can call out casual and what I call accidental racism wherever you see it. Because a lot of the time people are just, it's a place of ignorance, not racism. And that is something, if you have the knowledge you can help to correct that in a small way in your everyday life. When you hear uh, racist sort of casual things coming across or you hear slurs being used out of context, I know no one wants to be the person to step up and say that, but it is. It's a every small step this way can change um, perceptions of culture. To Roma, uh, the main message that we have is that you don't have to accept things the way they are. You can use the law in very easy, very small ways to get results, get access to justice for things that happen to you. A lot of the time, things that you might not even consider to be uh, an act of racial discrimination. It's the everyday things, getting suspiciously stopped by police officers, um, being made to wait longer in the queue at the doctors than your non Romney counterparts. These are acts of discrimination, which are in any EU country and most non-EU countries illegal under national law and certainly under international law but it doesn't even need to get that far you can go to your equality body you can go to your ombudsperson uh, you can go to local NGOs there's always uh, legal aid providers who will help you take these cases um, and a lot of the time even if it doesn't necessarily help your immediate situation you never know how it will affect the much wider uh, situation for Roma in your country. We have so many cases where one small case can get taken all the way up to the European Court of Human Rights and then we get a judgment handed down from them which stops that ever happening again to all sorts of people around you. So, use the law. I ask this of everybody that I talk to in these deep dive conversations. Do you believe that the arc of history bends towards progress? Mark Twain said, like, history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. Uh, Yeah, we can... There is a general slow burn arc towards progress. We have little dips. We have uh, comparative 
times in history where we can look back and say this is happening again. We can look back to the 1930s now and see a very similar situation in Europe then as now, and we can warn, take warnings from that. It's not going to be exactly the same, but we can also take sort of courage from the fact that uh, the institutions in place now compared to in the 30s are much stronger. Uh, the European Union, for a start, is an international community which will prevent largely the scale of war that we would have seen in Europe before then. Um, so yes, although sometimes there's very deep troughs, I'd say broadly things are getting better across the board, at least in terms of human rights. Jonathan Lee, thank you. Thank you.